الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الدين عند الله الإسلام رب شهل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي I welcome all the viewers on the Peace TV network as well as the people watching us on the various social media platforms that is YouTube Facebook, Twitter and Instagram as well as the people watching us live on the Al Hidayah platform. I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God be upon all of you. Inshallah we'll be starting with the session Ask Dr. Zakir and his son Sheikh Farik Season 7, Session 3. So let's start with the question answer session. Let's take the first question. Assalamu alaikum. I am an undergraduate student from Kashmir, India. My name is Nadia Yusuf. Is it already written that a person is going to ask for something or after asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes his taqdeer? Or after asking, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewrites his taqdeer. Regarding qadr, that is destiny, it is one of the pillars of iman. And in the hadith of Abdullah Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that iman, it is to believe in Allah and his angels and his books and his messengers and in the last day and in Qadr that is destiny good or bad so it is one of the six pillars of Iman to believe in Qadr that is destiny and Qadr what does it mean Qadr it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has written down what is going to happen regarding the actions of his creation well in advance and there are several verses in the glorious Quran which talk about Qadr that is destiny and as far as Qadr destiny is concerned there are three important points the first is the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is all knowledgeable and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has ilm ghayb that is knowledge of the unseen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what his creation are going to do and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is going to happen 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has ilm ghayb, knowledge of the unseen. The second is the writing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has written down regarding the actions of his creation, regarding what is going to happen well in advance. All of it has been recorded clearly in a book well preserved in Lawham Mahfuz. The third is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, it will happen. And whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not will, it will not happen. So we need to believe in all these three points as far as Qadr, as far as destiny is concerned. These three points, they are extremely important. And there are several verses in the glorious Quran that talk about Qadr, that is destiny. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran in Surah Al-An'am, chapter number 6, verse number 59. وَعِنْدَهُ مَفَاتِحُ الْغَيْبِ لَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّا هُ And he has the keys of the things that are hidden. No one knows it except for him. وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ And he knows what is in the sea and what is on land. وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ And he knows what is on sea and what is on land. وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا And not even a single leaf that falls except by his permission. وَلَا حَبَّةٍ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ الْأَرْضِ وَلَا رَطُبٍ وَلَا يَابِسٍ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ And not even a single grain that is in the darkest parts of the earth. And not even something that is fresh or dry except that he that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has recorded it clearly in a book well preserved. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written down well in advance what is going to happen regarding the actions of his creation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, Surah Al-Qamar, chapter number 54, verse number 49. Inna kulla shay'in khalaqnahu bi qadr. We have created everything with the destiny. That is divine preordainment. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has written down regarding what is going to happen well in advance. Now coming back to your question. That when we ask something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is it written in advance or after we ask something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes it. As far as taqdeer, as far as what, we, what actions we are going to do, all of it, it has been preserved in lawham mahfud. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written all of it down well in advance. regarding the actions of human beings and also the duas that any human being is going to do. All of this, it has been written down. And all of it has been written down in a book that is well preserved. Now, for example, if a calamity is going to befall a human being, if a calamity is going to befall a person, now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written it down in his taqdeer, in the destiny that on so and so day, on so and so time, a calamity is going to afflict so and so person. Now, this person, he does dua. He prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because of his dua, this calamity, it does not befall or afflict this person. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written it down in his taqdeer that so and so calamity will befall so and so person at so and so time. But because this person he will do dua, he will pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not let this calamity afflict this person. So the calamity was going to afflict this person. 
but because of his dua the calamity will not afflict this person so all of it is mentioned in the taqdeer in the destiny that this calamity will befall this person but because of his dua this calamity it will not befall this person so all of it is recorded clearly in lawh mahfuz now certain people might say that if everything has been written so why should i for example work hard in an examination if i'm going to fail it is already written in my destiny that i will fail and because of this thought a person he may not work hard it is written in the destiny of a person that this person generally he will work hard this person if he will work hard he will pass but because of this evil thought that came into his mind that crept into his mind and because he did not study he failed in his examination so generally he was going to study and pass but because of this evil thought that came into his mind that crept into his mind he did not study and he failed so all of it is clearly written in the lawh mahfuz that is well preserved so all of the actions of us human beings including the dua that we ask from allah subhanahu wa taala all of it it has been written written in a book well preserved and our beloved prophet muhammad peace be upon him said it is mentioned in sahih muslim amr bin al as may allah be pleased with him he heard the messenger of allah peace be upon him saying that allah subhanahu wa taala wrote down the decree the destiny of his creation 50000 years before he created the heavens and the earth i hope that answers your question we will take the next question my grandfather passed away last year is it permissible according to the sharia to slaughter on his behalf if it is permissible then how to do it as far as giving udhiya offering sacrifice on behalf of a dead person it can be divided into two types the first is the udhiya the sacrifice that is offered on behalf of a dead person and this person before dying he made a bequest he made a wasiya he made a wish before dying so in this situation his wish should be fulfilled if one can fulfill it as allah subhanahu wa taala says in the glorious quran in surah al baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 181 faman badalahu بعد ما سمعه فانما اثمه على الذين يبدلون as for the one who changes the wasiya the bequest after he has heard it so the sin will be upon the one who changes it so the first type is that if a person dies he leaves behind a wasiya that for example a goat be sacrificed on his behalf a sheep be sacrificed on his behalf so this situation his wash, his wasiya should be fulfilled the second type is that if a person dies and after he dies later on for example his relatives they want to volunteer all of them a halal unless proven that it is haram for example Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in no less than four different places in Surah Al Baqarah chapter number two verse number one seventy three in Surah Al Maida chapter number five verse number three in Surah Al Anam chapter number six verse number one forty five and in Surah Al Nahl chapter number sixteen verse number one hundred and fifteen. Hurrimat alaykum al maita tu wadam wa lahm al khinzir forbidden for you food ah dead meat blood flesh of swine and any food on which any other name besides Allah's name has been taken. So these four type of food they are prohibited for us Muslims. so generally all food it is halal unless there is an evidence which proves that it is haram for example why don't we have the flesh of swine why we muslims don't have it we have an evidence for it the verse of the glory is quran which prohibits it for example there is no verse of the glory is quran nor any authentic hadith hadith which says that having mango it is prohibited so we can have mango 
there is no problem in someone having mango. It is absolutely halal. For example, in Malaysia, there is a famous fruit and it is very popular known as durian. Many of the Malaysians, they like this fruit called as durian. Now durian, there is no verse of the glorious Quran, nor any authentic hadith which says that we, sh we cannot have durian or durian is prohibited. So having durian, it is permitted. There is no problem in having durian. Therefore, the second type of udhiyah that is sacrificed that I mentioned in my answer that is offered on behalf of the dead exclusively for the dead there is no evidence for this from the glorious Quran or from the authentic hadith of our beloved Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. That's the reason a person he should abstain from it and he should not do this act. If a person wants to benefit the dead, there is a hadith of Abdullah Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him wherein he said, إِذَا مَاتَ الْإِنسَانِ إِنْ قَطَعْ عَمَلُهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَاثِ صَدَقَةٌ جَارِيَةٌ عِلْمٌ يَنْتَفِعُ بِهِ وَوَلَدٌ صَالِحٌ يَدْعُوا لَهِ That when a person, in another narration it says, when the son of Adam dies or passes away, all of his deeds, they are cut off, except for three. An ongoing charity, beneficial knowledge that he has left behind, that people will benefit from it. And the third is a righteous child praying for him. So if you want to benefit the person who has died, you can do one of these three things. And there is a hadith of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, wherein a man came to our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and he said that, O Prophet of Allah, my mother has passed away. Can I give charity on her behalf? And will it benefit her? So our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, yes. So you can do one of these three things that I've mentioned, and inshallah, it will benefit the person who has passed away. The next question, how to wake up easily for tahajjud? Inshallah, I will mention three important points that will help you in getting up for the tahajjud prayer. The first and the most important is seeking the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 160. That if Allah helps you, none can overcome you. But if Allah forsakes you, who is there then who will help you? So let the believers put their trust in Allah. So the first and the most important thing is seeking the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want to get up for the tahajjud, if you want to get up for the night prayer, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 186. That when my servant calls upon me, say I respond to the call of the caller. We should call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's closer to us than a jugular vein. But unfortunately, we do not sincerely do dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you want to get up for the night prayer, for the tahajjud, before you sleep, make it a point that you do dua, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he wakes you up for tahajjud. And when you get up for tahajjud, so in tahajjud, during your tahajjud prayer, in your sujood, do dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he wakes you up the next day for tahajjud. You keep doing this till it becomes a routine. Once it becomes a routine, Inshallah, it will be difficult for you to miss the tahajjud prayer. So the first is seeking the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second is, 
as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran, in Surah al ankabut chapter number 29, verse number 69. وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلَنَا And those who strive in our way, we shall surely open up their pathways. So the second is striving and struggling. We need to strive, we need to struggle. We should try our level best to wake up for the tahajjud prayer. And there is a saying in the Arabic language, a very famous saying, which, which is, Man jadda wajada. That the one who works hard, he will get the one who works hard, he will get what he has worked hard for. So the second is hard work. The third is that you should try to do all the things and actions that will aid you and help you in getting up for the tahajjud prayer. And I would like to mention four points in this. The first is that make use of the alarm. If you cannot get up with a single alarm, then use a louder alarm. If you cannot get up with a louder alarm, then use two alarms or use three alarms. If you cannot get up with three alarms, use four alarms. If yet you cannot get up, then use two different types of alarms or three different types of alarms because our mind gets immune to a particular sound. The second is that if you are sleeping for six hours at night and you know that if you sleep for six hours at night it will be very difficult for you to get up for the tahajjud prayer. So extend your duration of sleep at night instead of sleeping 6 hours, sleep for 7 hours. And an average human being requires between 7 to 8 hours of sleep every night. So the average human being requires between 7 to 8 hours of sleep. A very small percentage of human beings, if they sleep less than 6 hours, they can function normally. So increase your duration of sleep. So the third point is increase your duration of sleep. The fourth point is that in, on certain days you may exert yourself excessively. For example, you may do excessive shopping, you may be outside, you may work a lot. So you, you will sleep for example 6 hours a day. You will follow your general pattern of sleeping. But because of your exertion, because you have exerted yourself, it will be difficult for you to get up. And you know this. So on that particular day, you should sleep extra. If you normally sleep 6 hours, you should sleep for 7 hours. So these 4 points, if you follow them, inshallah, it will help you in getting up for the tahajjud prayer. And if yet you cannot get up, so then you should look at what are the external factors or other reasons what is preventing you from getting up for the night prayer. For example, you may have rice before going to sleep. You may use, you may watch a lot of television. You may use the computer a lot. You may use the mobile phone a lot before sleeping. This will make it difficult for you to get up, for example. So, you should look at the extra factors or the external factors that are preventing you from getting up for the night prayer. So, inshallah, if you follow these points, inshallah, it will be easy for you to get up for the night prayer. And the night prayer, it is very important. And all of these four points that I mentioned, these four points, they are subjective. They can differ from person to person. Some people may not require the alarm at all. They can get up directly without the alarm. Some people, they may require a single alarm. Some people, they may require two alarms. So it differs from person to person. Each and every individual, he should look at his pattern of sleeping and he should judge it accordingly.
and the night prayer it is very important there are several ahadiths which talk about the importance and the significance of the night prayer abul prophet muhammad peace be upon him said it is mentioned in sunan abu daud hadith number 1398 man qama bi ashri ayah lam yuktab min alghafilin wa man qama bi mi'ah ayah kutiba min alqani kutiba min alqanitin wa man qama bi alf ayah kutiba min almuqantirin three types of people that are mentioned in this hadith of abul prophet muhammad peace be upon him the hadith of sunan abu daud Abdullah Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said the one who stands regularly in the night prayer and the one who recites 10 verses he will not be from among the heedless the one who recites 100 verses he will be from among the qanitin and the one who recites 1000 verses he will be from among the muqantirin three types of people that are mentioned in this verse the first is the one who recite 10 verses and they will not be from among the heedless and it is very easy almost all of us muslims can do this majority of the muslims know at least two surahs for example the last two surahs of the glorious quran the muawwidatain suratul falaq and suratul nas if you recite just these two verses it is equal to 11 verses and you will not be from among the heedless so you should try to do this you should try to get up and pray at the last third of the night if not the last third of the night at least the least that you can do is offer it after the isha prayer that is one raka of witr the second type of people that is mentioned in this hadith is the one who recite 100 verses they will be from among the qanitin the word qanitin is derived from the root word qanata which means dhalla wa khada'a which means to lower yourself which means to humble yourself and the word qanit it means al mutil fi at ta'at wal muwadhib alayha the one who does excessive good deeds and does it regularly and qanit it means devout it means an obedient person so if you recite 100 verses you will be from among the qanitin and reciting 100 verses the easiest way to do it is to recite from suratul bayyinah to suratul nas and inshallah you will complete 100 verses and the third category of people are those people who recite 1000 verses and they will be from among the muqantirin the word muqantirin is derived from the root word qintar and the word qintar and its derivatives are mentioned in the glorious quran in no less than three three different places in surah al in surah in surah ali imran chapter number 3 verse number 14 in surah ali imran chapter number 3 verse number 75 as well as in surah an nisa chapter number 4 verse number 20 Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ali Imran chapter number 3 verse number 14 Zuyyina lin nasi hubbu ash-shahawati min an-nisaa'i wal banina wal qanatir al-muqantarati min ad-dhahabi wal fiddah beautified for men are things what they desire from among women from among sons from among huge heaps of gold and silver and branded horses the word qinta the word muqantara is mentioned here which means huge heaps of gold and silver the verse says zuyyina lin nasi hubbu ash shahawati min an nisaa'i wal banina wal qanatir al muqantara the word muqantara is mentioned in this verse and it is also mentioned the word qintar in surah in surah al imran chapter number 3 verse number 75 as well as in surah surah an nisaa chapter number 4 verse number 20 So qintar it differs it can be huge heaps of gold and silver it can be huge heaps of wealth whereas qintar the higher level of qintar is as abul prophet muhammad peace be upon him said a qintar is better than the world and the wealth in it 
This is the higher level of Qintar. And the one who recites 1,000 verses, he will be from among the Muqantireen. And reciting 1,000 verses, the easiest way to, to do it is to recite two ajza, the 29 juz as well as the 30 juz. If you recite these two juz, it will equal to 995 verses. You can recite Surah Al-Falaq and inshallah you will complete 1000 verses. So we should try to do it as often as possible. We should try to do it once a month. If not once a month, once in six months. If not once in six months, at least try to do it in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. What better time to do it, to be from among the Muqantireen, than the last 10 nights of Ramadan. If not the last 10 nights of Ramadan, try to do it the odd nights among the last and nights of Ramadan. So we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may He make us from among the Muqantireen. This was the limited time that we had today. Inshallah, after a few minutes break, the remaining part of the session will be continued by my father. I would like to end this session. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا and الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ
الحمد للہ و صلاۃ وسلام علی رسول اللہ علیہ صاحب اجمعین اما آباد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ومن احسن قول ممن دعا الى الله و عمل صالحا قال ان من المسلمین رب شلی صدری و یسلی امری و حل العقدت من لسانی حفق و قولی اول کم آل دی ویورز آف دی پیس ٹی وی نیٹ ورک دی پیس ٹی وی انگلش دی پیس ٹی وی اردو the peace tv bangla and the peace tv chinese as well as my social media platforms which are the facebook the youtube the instagram the twitter and the alida platform i welcome all the viewers with the islamic greetings assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh may peace mercy and blessings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of almighty god be on all of you and i welcome you to this program Ask Dr. Zakir and his son, Sheikh Farik, Season 7, Session 3. I would like to thank Farik for handling the first part of the program. And in the second part of the program here, you are most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and compassion religion, or any question which a non-Muslim may have asked you and you are unable to reply, or any question that you find on the media attacking Islam, this is the opportunity. You can ask your question on any of the four social media platforms, but there are more chances if you ask on the Alida platform or as a text message on the WhatsApp number mentioning your question in brief and the country and the city from where you originate as well as your profession to the WhatsApp number plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero. Can you reduce the volume, please, Sheikh? I mean, can you reduce the volume of your thing? Here, you can ask any questions. <clears throat> Inshallah, we'll take the first question. The first question, Assalamu alaikum sir, wa alaikum assalam. My name is Pamela Sinha from Kolkata, India. I am working in a private sector as HR. I am a Hindu having a relationship with a Muslim man. We want to marry and our parents have agreed. I have full faith on Allah and I am going to revert before my marriage and we will do nikah then inshallah. But before that, my parents want Sindur Dan from our end. Is it possible for particular that day he can put Sindur on my head? Kindly respond to my message. I'll be grateful to you. Thank you. Sister Pamela asked a question that she is inshallah going to marry a Muslim man and she will revert and she has full faith in Allah and she will be accepting Islam. But before that, since she is a Hindu, her parents would want that the husband should put Sindur at least once. So is it permitted in Islam? First, let me explain what is Sindur and its background. Then I'll give a reply to your answer. Sindur is also called as Kumkum. In English, it's called as Vermilon. It's a cosmetic powder which contains cinnabar, which is mercury sulfide. It contains turmeric and lime. It mainly is of red color, but can also be of red orange color. And Sindur is one of the important customs and rituals in the Hindu marriage. There are many customs in Hindu marriage. One of the most important is Sindur. And this sindoor is put in the parting of the hair of the would-be wife. It's also called as mang. And it starts from the starting of the hair till the middle of the head. Sometimes it goes extends further. Some people only put in the starting of the partition of the hair. And this 
goes back to the tradition. It's also written in the mythology of the Hindu scriptures where you find that Sita was the wife of Ram. She had put the Sindur. And it can also be traced back to the Mohenjadala Harappan civilization. That is 5,000 years back. And this Sindur is mentioned even in the Puranas. So basically, it's a Hindu ritual, which is one of the important rituals of marriage. There are various other things. For example, there is a bindi, which is a dot on the forehead. There is a Manga Sutra, which is a bead of black and gold color. It's a necklace worn. All these are signs of a married woman. And Sindur, as I mentioned earlier, in the Hindu customs at marriage, the husband puts the Sindur the first time into the mang, into the partition of the wife from the starting till the midpoint or maybe extend or maybe less. It's red in color. And later on, she's supposed to put every day in her mang, in a partition, every day as a sign of a married woman. And that goes even with bindi, with a dot on the head, which is normally red color, but now we have multiple colors. Or, or the Mangal Sutra, a red, uh, a black and golden bead that is worn as a necklace. And I remember that once I have asked a Hindu that why do the Hindu women wear Sindur or Mangal Sutra or Bindi? He told me that the Hindu women who is married are told to wear this so that the people will come to know she is married. And no one will tease her. This was his answer. This is not the answer given in the scripture. So I told him that because the Hindus want to know that the girl is married or the woman is married, no one will tease her. That's the reason they wear Mangal Sutra or Bindi or Kumkum or Sindur. In Islam, irrespective whether she is a married woman or unmarried, you cannot tease any girl. You cannot even look or stare at a Namaram girl or a woman. It doesn't make a difference whether she married or not. This is as far as my reply to it is concerned. Now coming to the question of this lady that can the Muslim man who she's going to marry and she's going to accept the deen and I'm very happy about that. She believes that Allah is almighty and she agrees with the faith of Islam. But can she fulfill the wish of her mother, of her parents that can the Muslim man put Sindur once? The reply to this is, in Islam, you cannot follow any ritual of any other religion. It's prohibited if it's not mentioned in the Quran. There's a difference between a custom and a religious ritual. As far as customs are concerned, the traditions are concerned of a particular area, of a particular country, of a particular race. Following customs, if it goes against the principle of Islam, it is prohibited. But if it's not against the principles of Quran and the Sahih Hadith, you're permitted, it becomes Muba. But as far as the principles of Islam are concerned, you cannot do any religious ritual of any other religion. And this wearing or putting the Sindur by a man in the mang or in the partition of the hair of the wife is a Hindu ritual. And it believes that this will support and give protection. So this is the belief that this Sindur will protect the wife. And that's the reason when the wife becomes or when the woman becomes a widow, when the husband dies, the traditions or the rituals say that that should be removed. So maybe the mother-in-law or the sister-in-law will come and wipe off the Sindur or the Bindi or the bangles will be broken or the Mangal Sutra will be removed and then she has to wear a white sari. And these are the rituals. So in Islam, we don't believe that a Sindur can protect a woman. This is completely against the teaching of Islam. So based on this ritual, that a false belief that a Sindur will protect the woman, Islam prohibits that. Secondly, as far as the dress code of a Muslim is concerned, one of the criteria among the six criteria for a dress code is that it should not resemble that of any other religion. It should not be an identity of any other religion. 
like a Muslim cannot wear a cross, it's an identity of a Christian, or a Muslim woman cannot wear Sindur or a Tika or a Mang or a Manga Sutra. These are the identities of the Hinduism. So, based on this principle, it is prohibited for a man to put Sindur, for a Muslim man to put Sindur in the Mang or the partition of his wife. It is prohibited. So, I would suggest that we have to convince our parents that this is not a correct ritual. And today, in the 21st century, these things are followed less and less. Many centuries ago, yes, it used to be followed. In this today's century, majority of the women don't put Sindur. Out of these three signs, a small percentage were all three. Some may wear only Mangal Sutra, some may put Bindi, some may put only Sindur. But the percentage of Hindu married women putting, bin, putting Sindur today in the 21st century is a very small percentage. And in fact, there are movements in the Hindu women that this Sindur actually subjugates us to the husband. That's the reason we will not wear it. These are uh, the trends today. But irrespective of what the trend is today or what the Hindus believe, this is again the teaching of Islam. So I would request you to convince your parents that now since you agree with the teachings of Islam, you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the Almighty, I would request you to convince your parents that this is against the teachings of Islam and we don't believe that a small amount of powder every day put in your hair can protect you from evil or, or can safeguard you. This is some sort of a shirk also. What we Muslims believe is we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one to protect. You cannot believe that this red powder put in your hair as kumkum, kumkum or sindur can protect you. The one who protects is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah you will be able to convince your parents and I and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he guide you and your would-be husband to the straight path and inshallah, inshallah to follow more of the teachings of Quran and the Hadith. The next question, my name is Hamoud, I live in UK, I usually do small debates with Christians and Alhamdulillah in most of the cases I make them in a position to think that they are not on the right path, Alhamdulillah. But recently I had a debate with one of the practicing Christian, he asked me many questions but one of them I could not reply to him. He said that Jesus is God. I said, why? He replied, as he doesn't have a father and he is born miraculously. So I replied to him that in this sense, Adam, peace be upon him, should be a bigger God as he doesn't have a mother nor a father. Then he told me, Adam was born Jesus had a natural birth. This brother who claims that he is a Dai and, and Alhamdulillah he is involved in Dawa and he got stuck when he was speaking to a practicing Christian who said that Jesus is God and he said why and he gave the reply because Jesus was born miraculously. And the reply which he gave which even I have given in my lectures and in my talks that if Jesus is born miraculously and if he's God, then Adam, peace be upon him, should be a greater God because he had no father and mother. Jesus, peace be upon him, the Christians consider him to be God because he was born miraculously without a father. Then Adam, peace be upon him, should be a greater God because he had no father and mother. This Christian, supposed to be smart, and he gave the reply that Adam, peace be upon him, was not born. Jesus had a natural birth. And I've been in the field for Dawa for more than 25 years. And I've given this example to hundreds and thousands of Christians that when they say that Jesus is God because he had no father, and I gave the reply that then Adam has to be a greater God because the Bible says that, 
And the Quran says that he had no mother and father and they were stumped. This is the first time somebody, I'm hearing somebody replying, what if we realize that as a Dai, most of the answers that we give, or even in the Dawah training program, I tell to my students that the answers that we give, inshallah, the answers are so well formed with reason, logic, science, etc. It will satisfy, inshallah, more than 95% of the people. 95 to 99%, inshallah. But there are some people who will come with a counter argument. And for that counter argument, sometimes you may know the counter argument and you may know the reply, sometimes you may not know. So whenever a counter argument is given, a dai should be smart and use his hikmah and inshallah Allah helps you. This question was never asked to me before. It is the first time I am reading. What you have to do, you have to analyze the counter argument. So normally the answers that are given, inshallah will satisfy the majority, more than 95%. Then there is a second stage of argument called as a counter argument to a reply. And you may give the reply to the counter argument. Sometimes he may give a counter reply to a counter argument. That is the third level, a counter reply to the counter reply to argument. But inshallah, alhamdulillah, always truth wins. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81. Allah says, وَقُلْ جَعَلْ حَقَذَاكَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلِ قَانَا سَوْكَ When truth is held against falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood, it's bound to perish. Here we have to realize that debating is a skill. Just because you cannot answer doesn't mean that Islam is wrong. Now coming to your question, how to reply when a Christian says that Adam, peace be upon him, he was not born and Jesus had a natural birth. Here you find that the same Christian is contradicting himself. You said that the Christian said Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is God because he was born miraculously without a father. And then he's saying in the second statement that Adam, peace be upon him, was not born. Jesus had a natural birth. There's a contradiction. You as a Dai should pay attention to each and every word. So first he says he's God because he was born miraculously without a father. And in second statement he's saying that Jesus was born naturally. If he's born naturally, he cannot be God. There itself you win the argument. Coming to the point, we do agree that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was born miraculously. He didn't have a natural birth. For natural birth, there has to be fluid from the husband and the wife, male and the female, the sperm and the ovum, they meet, they form the zygote, and then the baby is in the womb of the, 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 womb of the mother for nine months, and then the child is born. In this case, there is no sperm involved. He was born miraculously, Bible says that, Quran says that. So his first statement that Jesus was born miraculously without a father is correct. But his second statement that because of this Jesus is God is wrong. And his third statement that Jesus was born peace be upon him, a natural birth is also wrong. So his first statement is correct, which the Quran says and the Bible says. His second statement is wrong based on the argument we give that the Bible says that Adam, peace be upon him, Almighty God created without a mother and father. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 59, where Allah says, Inna masala isa inna Allahi ka masala Adam. Khalqa min turab, summa qala lukun fayakun. The similitude of Jesus in front of Allah is like Adam, peace be upon him. He was created from dust and it was said, be, and he was. That means Allah says in the Quran, the example of Jesus in front of Allah is like Adam, peace be upon him. Adam was created from dust and he was said, be, and he was. So Allah created Adam, kun kun be, and it was. But in the creation of Adam, there was no mother and father. In the creation of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, there was no father. Both were miraculously born. We have to agree that being born without a father is a lesser miracle as compared to being born without a mother and father. In the case of Isa alayhi salam, in the case of Jesus, peace be upon him, according to the Bible, according to the Quran, he was born to a virgin mother Mary, Maryam alayhi salam. 
without any male intervention. It's a miracle. But just because it's a miracle, you don't make him God. He was given birth, he was born without a father by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, Adam, peace be upon him, is a greater miracle. He was created from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without a mother and a father. Your question is that Adam wasn't born. For him to be born, he has to have a mother. That's the reason he was not born is a double miracle. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was born miraculously, one miracle. Adam, peace be upon him, was not born and created, double miracle. No mother, no father. So your argument that Jesus was born naturally is totally wrong. It's again the teaching of a Bible, again the teaching of Christianity. So based on logic, that when you are saying that Jesus is God because he had no mother, then Adam, peace be upon him, has to be a bigger God because he had no mother and father. And this logic is wrong. That's the reason we have to agree that Jesus, peace be upon him, and Adam, peace be upon him. Both of them, they were messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Both of them were created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala miraculously. That doesn't make them God. They were messengers of God. Hope that answers the question. The next question. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. I am Shabina Parveen from India, Kolkata. I am currently living in Sydney as a permanent resident with my husband. My husband is a software engineer and I am PhD in biochemistry. Would it be halal for us to apply for citizenship here? Please note, I am living in a Muslim majority suburb of Sydney with no restrictions in practicing my religion in any way. Jazakallah. Sister Shabina Parveen, who is originally from Kolkata, India, has shifted to Sydney uh, in Australia and she has got permanent residency. And now she is eligible to apply for citizenship. She is asking the question that is it halal or is it permitted for her to apply for citizenship of the country of Australia? Before I give the reply, you may have heard, I'm sure, my answer to the question that can Muslims migrate from Muslim country to non-Muslim country for a better living? And I gave the answer that according to authentic scholars, according to scholars who give their fatwa on Quran and Sahih Hadith, they have said that for a Muslim to migrate from a Muslim majority country to a non-Muslim majority country, it is not permitted. And their argument is based, and the fatwa is based on the verse of the Quran of Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 97 to 100. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 97, that when the angel of death comes to take the soul of those who have died in sin against their soul, they ask the question, that what was your state when you lived? And they reply, we were weak and oppressed on this earth. So the angels reply, is not the earth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spacious enough? so that you could have migrated away from the evil and Allah says and continues in this verse that hell is the abode for such Muslims this verse of the Quran if you read the tafsir it says it was revealed for people for Muslims who were living in non-Muslim countries and this verse was revealed telling them that if you are in a non-Muslim country you have to migrate because you cannot practice Islam completely. You have to migrate. And if the angel of death comes to take your soul for those people who have sinned and when they ask what was the state, they reply, you are weak and oppressed. So the angel says, is not the earth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spacious enough for you to migrate? So such people 
for them hell is the board this is surah nisa chapter 4 verse number 97 then the verse continues verse number 98 that except for those who are oppressed and weak amongst men women and children amongst men women and children who don't have the means to migrate then the verse continues verse number 99 for them allah has given forgiveness for allah is us forgiving and most merciful so based on this these three verses of the quran the scholars say that for a muslim living in a muslim majority country he cannot migrate to a non-muslim country for a better living except there are certain situations if you are going to be a full-time die some of the scholars give permission not all regarding those muslims who are living in a non-muslim country what should they do so the ruling on this verse of the quran is Allah is instructing them to migrate to a place where the Islamic law is followed or where the Muslim land majority. That is the best. Except if you are oppressed and weak and you don't have the means to migrate, then Allah will forgive you. So that time it becomes makro because you don't have the means. But the first option is you have to migrate. If you are weak and oppressed and don't have the means, then you can stay. Allah will forgive you. Or, and then the scholars say that if you are born in a non-Muslim country, the mustahab, the preferred thing is you migrate to a Muslim country where you can practice Islam more freely. But if you are living in a non-Muslim country where you can practice all your faraiz and where you can practice your deen without any restriction, as the sister said, then you can stay but it becomes makru can stay but it becomes makro and the next verse continues surah nisa chapter 4 verse number 100 as to those who forsake their home for the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and go to a foreign land and die in that foreign land for the sake of allah and his rasul for them allah has prepared a great reward allah is saying that those people who forsake their home for the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and die away from their home for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah will create Allah will give them a great reward and the tafsir say that is Jannah now coming to your question that I am living in Sydney in a Muslim majority area and I can practice my deen without any restrictions the word she says is I am living in a Muslim majority suburb of Sydney with no restrictions in practicing my religion in any way. This statement I doubt is possible in any of the non-Muslim country in any major city. That you can practice your deen without any restrictions in any way. Without restriction in any way. Double emphasis. Sister, there may be two things. Either you may not be knowing your deen well or maybe you may not be knowing the laws of your country well and other aspects I feel it's not possible in any non-Muslim country especially if it's a major city like Sydney that you can practice your deen without any restrictions in any way yes there can be possible a living in a town or living in a small village in a non-Muslim country there may be less restriction that's possible that you can maybe practice your sum of your farais or majority of your farais it's possible but to say you can practice your deen without any restrictions is impossible why there are various things people think that only because they can offer salah and they can fast and they can give zakat and they can perform hajj the deen is complete that is a very small understanding of the deen those are only the pillars. In that's what your understanding of deen is. Okay, it's possible. But the understanding of deen is much bigger. There are various things. One of the important for us is dawah. And I know that in most of the countries, doing dawah in non-Muslim country is not easy. Certain level, okay. But the moment you reach a higher level, surely they will not permit you. And even most of the da'is that are there in the non-Muslim countries, there are restrictions. They cannot do dawah freely like how you can do in a Muslim country, like how I can do in Malaysia. 
It's difficult. There are many restrictions. Okay, maybe if you're doing dawah on a small level to a small group without any much success, okay. It may be possible. But the moment you get success, what you have to do, you'll have to change your dawah. Then you may have to start telling, you know that, okay, and, and we see that. That there were many good, mashallah, Muslim dais who were very knowledgeable. When they shifted to a Western country, to a non-Muslim country, you found in the passage of time that they started changing their view. And they said, okay, fine, now shaking hand with opposite sex, it is not haram, it should not be done, but if done, it's not a sin. Where you get this from? Our beloved Prophet clearly said that anyone touches a Nahmerab, that part will burn in hell. So then you find many guys saying, okay, LGBT, uh, lesbian, gay, homosexual, fine it is, you have to be kind, being kind is not a problem, but you have to understand that this is acceptable and they try and change. Maybe 10, 15 years back, they said it is haram. So what happens, they start changing their deen to adopt to the rules and regulation of the non-Muslim country. And the good guys, I know many who lived in the western countries, they could not tolerate, they came back. Some were hunted out who were successful, some had to come back. You can give many examples. Yet there are some guys which are there. So you find that most of the Muslims now living in western countries, either they have migrated from a Muslim country, and many of them from Pakistan, from, uh, from Bangladesh, uh, from the Indian subcontinent. Or maybe the parents or the grandparents have migrated, so they are born there. If you migrate yourself, it is not permitted. If you are born there, then you take the fatwa, better to mig migrate to a Muslim country back. Or if you can practice your deen, it is permitted, but it is makhru, according to the top scholars. I know people will not agree with this answer. They will say these scholars are wrong and they'll debate with them. But the verse of the Quran is very clear cut. It was revealed specifically to the Muslims living in non-Muslim country. So I agree with the fatwa of the scholars and the verse of the Quran, which is very clear cut, that to migrate and you being from coming from India, and the Indian subcontinent before the British had split, India was ruled by about a thousand years by the Muslims. They were close to majority, maybe 40% or more. Later on, the British has come and they divide the Muslims into three parts, into Pakistan, Bangladesh, so one third approximately in Pakistan, one third in Bangladesh, approximately one third in India. India had a larger chunk than the other two countries. And they split. But India has a Muslim personal law. When India split, it has a Muslim personal law and few non-Muslim countries have a Muslim personal law which says that a Muslim, any person can preach, practice and propagate their religion. And especially for the Muslims, there is a Muslim personal law means you can follow all the rules and regulations mentioned in the Quran and Sahih Hadith. So in the non-Muslim countries, those Muslim countries which have, which permit a Muslim to follow the Muslim personal law is far better like India, then living in a western country like America or Canada or Australia where you are not permitted to follow all your Muslim personal faith. You say no restrictions. Can a man marry two wives officially in Australia? And the answer is no. After a person dies, there is inheritance which has to be given according to the basis of the, of the Quran. In the other law, it's according to the law of the country, unless you specifically mention a will. There are various things, various things. I'm just talking some of them. I do agree that in certain parts, you can follow most of it. But saying with no restriction whatsoever, I disagree with you. I've been to Australia twice. I've also been to Sydney. And... I've seen the life there. It is just like any Western country. Maybe the levels may differ, but you have the same fayash. When you go out in Sydney, you see billboards of obscene photos on it of women very scantily dressed. You have to do good. How can you say you can practice your deen? Every day you go to do good, you have to keep on looking down. There are various 
other factors. The zina is so common. Zina is everywhere in the world, but in the Western world, the percentage is high. Whether it be America, whether it be Canada, whether it be European countries, whether it be Australia, the percentage is much higher than the Muslim countries. The chances of drug addiction is much more. The chances of your children being involved in alcoholism, into adultery, into fornication, into drug addiction is much higher. And practice, yes, you can practice some certain parts, but you cannot say with no restrictions at all. So I personally believe in the fatwa of those scholars that you should not migrate, so you have migrated. So I would, if you ask me, is it correct for you to apply for citizenship? I would say no. Because whatever said and done, India now, lately, after the BJP government has come, there are problems for Muslim in the last six, seven years since they have come to power. There has been problems. There has been attacks on Muslims. Yet, it, according to me, it is multiple times better than the Western non-Muslim countries like America or Australia or Canada or European countries or UK. Anytime. Because the risk of your child or you going to do haram activities is much higher. And here, because in India, though the present government, BJP, ruled by Narendra Modi, they are attacking the Muslim, they are not following the constitution, it is a small faith. But as per the constitution, India is one of the few countries where any citizen can preach, practice and propagate his religion. And I was doing that for so many years. And I was there in that country, now because of the success, I had to do hijra. And I did hijra. And that's one of the best things I did in my life. Alhamdulillah. So as for you being an Indian and you're coming from Kolkata, which is not controlled by BJP, it is safe. Like states like Kerala are very good. States like Kolkata, it's not controlled by BJP. You will not have those problems that you have in UP and the other parts of India. So I would suggest that you living in India is much better. But I do agree with you that living in a Western country, the chances of luxury of the world is much higher. But natural, you said that your husband is there and you are done PhD in biochemistry. But natural, what you'll earn in Australia, in Sydney, will be multiple times more than what you earn in, in India. So in terms of worldly things, of course, the chances that Australia would give you more worldly luxury is multiple times more than India. That is a factor, the reason people migrate. It is not for other things. And this thing of the dunya, a Muslim mainly should strive for akhirah. Allah says that if a person asks for dunya, Allah gives this dunya but doesn't give akhirah. If a person asks for akhirah, Allah gives akhirah and this dunya also. Or you can ask for both and the famous dua that Rabbana Atina fit dunya hasnata wa fil akhirat hasnata kin azab bin nar that O oh Lord, O oh Lord, give us the best in this world and the hereafter and save us from the torment of hellfire. Here are three things you are asking. Give us the best in this world and the best in the hereafter and save us from the torment of hellfire. Out of three things, two things are about akhirah. Best in next world and save us from the torment of hellfire. And one third is for this dunya. So if you are asking for both, see to it that more is akhirah and less is dunya. If you ask more for dunya, before this verse, if you read the verse before this, verse the Rabban Atina, it's Surah Bakra chapter 2, verse number 201. One verse before that, Surah Bakra chapter 2, verse number 200 says that those people who ask for this world will give them the world, but not the Akhirah. And then this dua starts. So, Alhamdulillah, because of my answers and my lectures, there are thousands of Indians, Pakistanis and Bangladeshis who wanted to settle in the Western countries, in America, in Canada, in uh, Australia, and Alhamdulillah, they've changed the decision. And amongst the non-Muslim Western countries, one of the best, I would say, though not good to go, is Canada. Because the president of Canada has a soft corner for the Muslims, and it is better than USA or Australia. But even in Canada, just a couple of weeks back, we heard that a young man when he sees a family who wants to cross the road, a family of five or six people, 
he takes his truck and dashes into them and all of them die except one child why islamophobia just for the hate of the muslims before that a few months before that there was a muslim who comes out of the mosque in canada i think it was toronto suburbs and in the car park someone comes and slits his throat he dies on the spot there are very such cases i'm not saying that these incidences don't happen in the muslim majority country but imagine you living in a country where the islamophobia where people are coming and attacking you the people are bombing your mosque i know in new zealand what happened that a person came and he bombed the mosque and about 50 people were killed and he takes a gun and he kills the people so these incidences of islamophobia of attacking the muslim are quite common you cannot neglect them i know many guys whose children are involved in alcoholism in adultery in fornication in drug addiction many i cannot name them so even children of thy who will you blame if your child deviates away from islam that's the reason there are many guys who know who have come back but that doesn't mean everyone who hears this answer will follow though there are thousands of people who have not gone to the western countries to settle there are more thousand number of people have heard my answer and yet gone why because the love of dunya is there and a decent dear friend of mine he is a student of knowledge complete master and just completing his phd he asked me that he got a job offer in australia and the job offer is very lucrative 70000 pounds a year very good and it comes to about 4 and a half to 5000 us dollars a month very good should i go i told him as far as the worldly status is concerned it's difficult for you to get such a good offer of 4 and a half to 5000 us dollars a month you're not famous if you're a famous okay and 70000 australian dollar a year such an offer i doubt you'll get anywhere else in the world it's a very lucrative so for dunya it's very good but if you ask my advice that should you migrate i would say no and the reason are the same it's risking your akhirah the quran is against it there are scholars who have given fatwa you should not do it but whenever we give advice it's not possible that everyone follows it every time and if more lucrative they offer the more chances that they will not follow the right what if you realize that many of them and even the friend of oh i'll go there for 5 years then come back i told him that if you go for 5 years and you think you'll come back more than 95% you won't come back unless you're kicked out of the job or someone takes you out of the country because once you get the taste of it the luxury you get a car you get to see all these worldly things your nafs will not prevent the nafs will not allow you to come back and the same thing happened with your sister now you got a residency now you got to offer a citizenship oh citizenship of australia such a good offer so why allow the this these are khutwa to shaitan why allow first of all go there fine if you are living over here you are a foreigner living in malaysia malaysia one of the best countries to live in and you can hear my answer if you are getting four times more for here you may get maybe 4000 ringgit 5000 ringgit they are getting 4000 5000 $5, maybe four times more a dollar to a ringgit is four times the cost of living there is high so in terms of comparison it may be double benefit the salary may be four times higher but the cost of living in australia may be double of of malaysia so net benefit may be double so yes you may have luxury of life but the security of the deen in malaysia is multiple times more than leading your life in australia but what you have to realize that even with the knowledge of deen the shaitan is there the shaitan is there to okay no problem don't go forever where are we telling you your children are young go there for four five years earn money come back what are you going to do for five months i'm going to make a palace when you go to four five months okay now i've got a permanent residency okay now you can apply for citizenship and the person settles there if you're kicked out of the country 
or if there are problems, we'll come back. So many a times, the problems are a blessing in disguise. So, my reply to you, sister, is my humble request to you that you've already spent so many years there. My advice to you is, and you will realize that I don't know how many children you have or you'll be having children in the future. This is very risky. On the day of judgment, if your child becomes a drug addict or get involved in zina or gets involved in other things which are haram, on the day of judgment, who will be responsible? Who took him there? The parents. Will you be able to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The risk is too high. I know that there are many of the Western guys may not agree with my reply, but I do agree with those scholars who on Quran and Sunnah who have given the fatwa based on the verse of the Quran of Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 97 to 100. And, and my advice to you, sister, is that the best would be that you go to any other Muslim majority country, try and see to get a job in a Muslim majority country, that is the best. But going back to India, to Kolkata, with this situation, is far better, much safer to protect your deen than to continue your life in Sydney. Hope that answers the question. <clears throat> On the Facebook, we have Alia Yusuf Dalhatu, Muhammad Asif, Saiful Islam, Muhammad Fahim, Tamil Josh, Jahidul Islam, Salim Yusuf, Hussein Ali, Kamal Alfred Kona, Muhammad Suhail Akhtar, Muhammad Chan Mia, Mustafa Ayyad, Azra Rashid, Sky Noor, Amir Suhail, Saddam Alansi, Muhammad Ayyaz, most of them are saying Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Assalam, Dala Barakatuh, they are doing duas for me, I do duas to you too, duas for you too. On the YouTube, we have Shams Talib, Fahim Hassan, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Assalam, Faiz Ahmad, Sara Osman, Nasir, Wasif Iqbal, Noor's Food Guide, M Crypto, Irfan Habib, Hafiz Shafirzal, Iman Omar, Assalamu Alaikum, Malikum Salam. I pray for all the people. The question on the YouTube from Ghazi Muhammad Rayyan. I had a bank account to which had interest in it because I live in India and there is no Islamic banking in my state but then I realized it and closed the account. But now I want to open an account, what should I do? Brother Ghazi has said that he lives in India, he had a bank account which was interest based. When he came to his haram, he closed it. Now he wants to have a bank account, what should he do? I am aware that there are no Islamic banks in India. So the next best option is that you open an account in a conventional bank, but open as a current account. A current account is an account which does not involve interest. It should not be saving account. It should not be fixed deposit. It should be a current account without any interest. So if you open a current account without interest, because of compulsion, you don't have an Islamic bank, and you have to have a bank in order to do business, or if you're doing a job, your salary comes in the account, for various purposes. So in this case, you open an account in any of the conventional bank and see to it, it's a current account without any interest. Inshallah, you will be free from riba directly and Inshallah, it will not be a sin.
there's a question asked again on the YouTube. From Aiza T. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Can a Muslim girl study in a university with an aim of getting an office job? As far as women in Islam are concerned, it's not compulsory that they should work, but because the earning is on the shoulders of the man in the family. Before she's married, it's the duty of the father and the brother, and after she's married, it's the duty of the wife and it's the duty of the husband and the son to look after lodging, boarding, clothing, and all financial aspects. So in Islam, a woman is financially secured. She need not earn her own living. It's the duty of the man in the house to take care of a living. But if she wants to do a job and wants to contribute in the financial earnings of the family, she's permitted as long as the job is halal and doesn't break any of the rule of the Quran or the Sahih Hadith. As long as within the point of the Islamic Sharia. So can a Muslim woman study university? Yes, it's good. The first guidance given in the Quran was Iqra, read, recite the deen as well as the worldly knowledge. And uh, the Prophet said it is obligatory on every Muslim man or woman to acquire knowledge. It's the knowledge number one, even the worldly knowledge. So going for a woman to go to university is no problem, but see to it, you go to a, woman's, uh, a university which the hijab is maintained, preferably to a woman's university. Can you do office job? When you do the office job, see to it that the job you are doing doesn't break the hijab. Not that you're doing office job where there's intermingling with men, higgling, hanging with men. See to it to do an office job in the ladies' section only. Preferably. Or you're doing a job where it may be as a nurse taking care of the female patients. Depending upon the job. If the job is as per the guidance of Quran and Sunnah, it doesn't break any of the teachings of the Quran and Sahih Hadith, that job is permitted. So women can go to university, see it's a university which maintains the hijab. You can take an office job, no problem, but the job should be a job which is halal. Hope that answers the question. Another question on the YouTube from Firwa Sirfaz. Sir Fraz, do I, being a Muslim girl, have to take hijab or veil before my brother-in-law, my sister's husband? What if my family doesn't allow me to? The question is that does a lady have to do hijab with a brother-in-law, sister's husband? And the answer is yes. For a lady, she should do hijab in front of the sister's husband. It's a fardha. The sister's husband is not your mahram. What if your family doesn't allow? You have to put your foot down. If the family tells you to do something haram, you don't have to obey them. Let it be whoever. First comes Allah and his Rasul. So any of a family member tells you to do anything which is against the Quran or against the teaching of Sayyid Hadith, you can very well put your foot down. You can disobey them. So if your family member tell you not to do hijab, you said, no, I will do hijab because that is the part of the deen as mentioned in the Quran and mentioned in the Hadith. The Quran clearly mentions in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31, say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty and display not the beauty except in front of her husband, her father, her son, and a big list of mahram is given. The mahram in front of who she need not do hijab, that is the husband, that is the father, that is the son, and the brother-in-law is not mentioned here. So the verse of the Quran is very clear-cut that those in front of whom you don't have to do hijab is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31. So when Allah has commanded you to do hijab in front of all the other males, you have to do, irrespective of whether your family agrees with or not, you have to follow the hijab. Hope that answers the question.
Next question. Hi, sir. I am Abrar. I am a student. I am 19 years old and I am a Bangladeshi. Allah said to pray and ask anything what we want from him. But why do we need to ask since Allah already knows what we want and need? So why do we need to keep asking for what we want? This is a very important question asked by Abrar, who is 19 year old. He's coming from Bangladesh. And he says that Allah asks us to ask him what we want. It's correct. It's the verse of the Quran. He asked me and I'll answer a prayer. Then he asked the question, Allah knows everything. And yes, Allah knows everything. So if Allah knows everything, Allah even knows what we want. And he's right. So why does Allah want us to ask him? It's a very tricky question. And I agree with him that Allah has asked us to ask him for help, number one. I agree Allah has ilm he knows everything. He even knows what you want. So the third question, why does Allah want us to ask him? The reply is given in the Quran in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2. Allazi khalaqal mawta wal hayata. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good indeed. So Allah has created the death and life in this world that we human beings come. Allah is testing us. So we have come in this world as a test for the hereafter. Allah 100% knows what every human being wants. Then why is he asking us to ask him? He wants to check whether you believe that you have to ask in Allah or not. Allah is asking us to ask him not because he doesn't know. He has in my game. He wants to test us that do you believe that Allah is the ultimate one who gives you? Whatever you want, the ultimate person who fulfills your desire is Allah. He may have a zariya through whom he does it. Let me give you a small example. Suppose a person is sick. An atheist is there. What does he do? He goes to a doctor. And he gets cured. He thinks, who has cured him? The doctor has cured him. He doesn't believe in God. We have another example of a non-Muslim. Who gets sick he goes to a doctor and he goes to a temple and he prays to God and he's cured that Hindu he believes in a false God he does idol worship he thinks that false God has cured him then you have a Muslim Allah wants to see that when Allah has asked you to ask him that atheist is not asking him he has failed the test that Hindu, he is asking a false god, even he has failed the test. Now you being a Muslim brother, Abrar, Allah wants to check whether you ask him or not. So what do the Muslims do? The Muslims, there may be some Muslims, let's go from lower level to high level, and you'll get the answer. Some Muslims who may not be very practicing Muslim, what do they do? That they go to a doctor, and they get cured if they are sick, that's it. Maybe the disease is a, a bit more chronic, so they go to one doctor, they don't get cured. They go to a second doctor, they don't get cured. The disease continues for several months, then they remember Allah. So then they start praying to Allah. Alhamdulillah. So now, they believe in the doctor, they believe in Allah also. What does Allah say? Allah says in the Quran, besides saying, ask me and I will answer your prayer, Allah also says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 43, and Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 7, First, alu ahli zikri in kuntula talamun. If you don't know, ask the person who knowledge. But that means, if you are sick, who do you have to go? Do you have to go to a barber? Do you have to go to a cobbler? Do you have to go to an engineer? If you are sick, you have to go to a doctor. So going to a doctor is an advice given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran and Hadith. That doesn't mean if you believe in God, don't go to a doctor. You have to go to a doctor. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, trust in God, tie your camel and trust in God. When a person came to him and said that, should I leave my camel like that without tying and trust in God? Or should I tie the camel and then trust in God? Our beloved Prophet said, tie your camel and trust in God. Trusting in God doesn't mean that you leave your house door open, you throw your money on the street and say no one will rob it. No, trust in God means 
you follow the rules and regulation. You have to close the door of your house so that no one enters it. You don't have to keep it open. If you are sick, you have to go to a doctor. Trust in God, but tie your camel. So here, tying your camel means if you are sick, you go to a doctor and do also. So a person who is less practicing may go to a doctor and may not do do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person who is medium practicing will go to a doctor and then do do dua also. There may be a time that initially you don't remember Allah only when the disease is not cured you start remembering Allah. Alhamdulillah. Now Allah is testing you that do you ask Allah or not? Okay. Maybe you may not ask initially then you ask later on. No problem. Better late than never. There may be a situation that you may ask and the dua is not fulfilled. What do you do when you go to a doctor and your disease is not cured? You go to another doctor or you go to a better doctor. There is no one better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what do you do? You follow the guidance of Allah given in the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. For example, if you are sick, and this example can be for anything, whether you want to pass an examination or whether you want to do good in, you want to do good in business. I'm taking the example of being sick. You do dua normally. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my knee is paining. Please, please give me shifa. And the knee is yet paining. Then you follow the guidance. Allah wants to check you. Do you follow the guidance in the Quran and Sunnah? That there are some times which are more preferred time to pray than other times. You can pray any time of the day, permitted. But how? You go to a normal doctor first. Then you realize you have a heart problem. Then you go to a heart specialist. You go to a more qualified doctor. There is no one better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah has told you the times which are preferred for prayer. Then what you do? You start praying in the salah. Just before you end the salah, you can do dua. That's a much better time than praying any time. You can do dua in the sujood. You keep on improving. Or you can pray in the tajud salah. That's much better. Or during the last one hour after asar salah on Friday. That's a better time. According to me, the best, the most best time the most auspicious or, or rather I would say the most important time where your, the chances of your prayer being heard I would say number one would come on the day of Arafah in Arafah when you are doing Hajj after the Asar prayer before the Maghrib time this time is the most important time of the Hajj during the day of Arafah in Arafah when you are doing Hajj in Ahram, after your Asar Salah, before the Maghrib Salah, this is the time for Dua. And if Allah accepts your Hajj, you come out as though you are sinless. So number one. Number two or is doing Dua during Laylatul Qadr. About Laylatul Qadr, you can hear my talk on Laylatul Qadr. Laylatul Qadr, as Allah says in the Quran, is more, is better than a thousand months. It's equal to more than 80 years of your life. More than an average human being that lives. So next best would be praying during Laylatul Qadr. Third best would be praying in Tahajjud Salah, in the last one third of the night, in Fajda and asking to Allah. And there is a scholar who said that people who say, I have tried everything and my problem is solved. And my problem is not solved. So one scholar said, you cannot say that you have tried everything for a problem to be solved unless you have asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in tahajjud salah, in the last one third of the night in your sajda. And that any Muslim can do. Okay, going to hajj is difficult. Some people will not have the opportunity ever in their lifetime. They may be poor. Some people do Hajj only once in the lifetime, some people few times, some people many times. But you cannot say for sure you will get an opportunity. It's once in a blue moon. For some it's not possible at all. Where it comes to Laylatul Qadr, it's once in a year. 
but tahajjud you can pray every night of your life every 24 that comes so that is the reason the scholar said that no one can say that he has tried everything to solve his problem unless he asks Allah in the tahajjud salah in the last one third night in the sujood that means asking Allah generally is good but not sufficient you cannot say I've tried everything so these are the first three levels then I would say would come praying on Friday one hour after Asar before Makran this is another time auspicious time then when you are fasting just before you break the fast that's important mustab time where you can do dua and there are various other times these are the top important three four that I mentioned there are many other things for example you are traveling you do dua it's accepted after the azan you do dua it's accepted in the salah before you end your salah before you say salam you can do dua you can do dua in the sujood it's of the and so on and so forth so here Allah is testing you Allah says ask me and I will answer your prayer so first you ask generally normally then if you want better results maybe during salah in your sajda or before your salam or maybe on a Friday one hour it comes once a week after asar salah then the high level is tajjud last one third night you have to get up in the middle of the night if you are reading tajjud alhamdulillah not reading you will have to get up so there are levels Allah wants to test you so Allah is asking you to ask him and he will answer the prayer not because he doesn't know you you are foolish to think that Allah doesn't know you Allah knows Allah wants to test you to what level can you go to ask Allah and it's finally Allah who is Shafi it is he who cures he may do generally he may do through a doctor he may do, do through a miracle and I know I have an example that I had a knee problem in 2011 and 12 for two years I I was praying on a chair I missed doing the sajda and it was very difficult to pray on the chair not difficult for this because I had a knee problem and when and I could not go in sujood I could not go in many I'm going to kneel down I went to so many doctors I had to do dua with all the doctors with different countries I traveled no solution I go to Dubai and there's a person who's a specialist in massage a sports massagist and he was a Muslim from Lebanon always in Quran he did massage for seven minutes and all my problems are solved no tablets I'm taking nothing no exercise totally gone in seven minutes it's a miracle who cured Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through whom through the massagist through a sports medicine massagist who Allah may have given shifa in his hand top doctors I went to nothing happened the whole reason was I did dua to Allah and I prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah cured me so Allah checks how you follow and how much you obey him so this is one of the reasons Allah says you ask me and I will answer your prayer Allah is checking you do you really believe that it is Allah who is giving you the higher level taqwa is that I'm asking a simple question that do you thank Allah for all the things he has given you have you thanked Allah for the house he has given you for the clothes he has given you for the food he has given you have you ever thanked Allah for the water you drink it is free have you thanked Allah for the air you breathe you don't get water for a few weeks you will die you don't get air for a couple of hours you will die have you thanked Allah for that and most of us the answer would be no so good Muslim is who who always thanks Allah for his dhamma he thanks Allah and prays to him for forgiveness and thanks him for all the niyama and whatever happens he thinks that Allah has chosen the best for him and we have faith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives everything and if 
Your dua is not answered. The, what I normally say, that if the dua is answered, if my dua is answered, I'm happy. If my dua is not answered, I'm happy ten times more. Why? Because the first was my choice, the second is Allah's choice. So if Allah doesn't answer my dua, I believe that's his choice that will be better for my akhirah. Maybe my sins are being washed. Or whatever the reason may be. So this is the faith that a believer has. And he always says, Alhamdulillah. If there is prophet, he says, Alhamdulillah. If he says loss, he says, Alhamdulillah. Allah, if Allah wasn't there, the loss would have been much higher. So this is the way Allah tests the believers in your day-to-day -day life. And that's the reason every Muslim should pray to Allah and to the water. Hope that answers the question. The next question. <clears throat> My name is Lamin S. Bojang from the Gambia. Are we Muslims allowed to choose sports as a profession, especially football? As far as playing football or any sports is concerned, first I'll give you the general ruling and then I'll come to the ruling of sports as a profession, especially football. As a general ruling, any sports that you play, if it keeps you fit, it keeps you healthy, as long as that sport doesn't go against the teachings of Quran and Sai Hadith, it is permitted. And most of the sports, it keeps you healthy, it keeps you fit. And even according to fatwa of, uh, of Ibn Qayyum and, uh, and Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah that the sports that you do as long as it keeps you fit and it's not against the teachings of the Quran or teachings of the Sunnah, it's permitted. And this is the ruling which is common amongst all the scholars, including football including football, if it keeps you fit and good, if it's not against the religion of Quran Sunnah, football per se is not haram. But coming to your basic question, your question was that can I choose football as a profession? And football as a profession, the fatwa differs, the difference of opinion. There are some scholars who say that choosing football as a profession is not permitted and it is haram. And amongst them, one famous scholar is Sheikh Muhammad Ibn Ibrahim. And in his book, Fatwa Ibn Ibrahim, that is 8 stroke, 116, 117, 118, 119, he gives various reasons why football as a profession is haram. And he says, that no one has the right to give fatwa whether football is allowed as a profession or not unless he knows the details of the profession of football. This is the starting. That no one has the right to give a fatwa whether football is allowed or not unless he knows the details of the profession. Indicating that other fatwas which may the scholars have given permitted, they may not be knowing about the details of the profession of football. And he goes on to say, and he gives various reasons why it is haram. I'll just list down the important reasons he gives. Number one, he says, you may have to compromise with the aura. That the aura will be exposed. Number two, he says that you may miss your congregation salah. Or you may miss your salah, therefore it's haram. Number three, he says that there may be factionalism. That you make two groups. And there are factions among them. Number four, he says, there can be injury. And very often people break their leg, they break their bones. That's the reason you find always 
there is ambulance waiting when there is a football match. Fifth reason he gives that many a time you have to travel to foreign countries and when you go to foreign countries you may have to do haram activities. That is the reason he gives the fatwa for these reasons. He says football as a profession is haram. I do agree with a great extent to Sheikh Muhammad ibn Ibrahim but not totally. What he is talking about football as a profession is on the very high level. I agree with him to a great extent on the high level professionalism if you become a world class football player. If you are playing for the World Cup or for the Euro Cup or that level, you know, the top level, the top four or five football, on that level he is correct to a great extent but not completely. But generally football as a profession to say it's haram, I disagree with him. I agree with this first part of his fatwa that a person should know the rules of football as a profession before giving the fatwa. And Alhamdulillah, I have many friends who are professional football players, not that they are in the top league, not in the international league, not even national league. So profession as a football doesn't have to mean that you enter the World Cup or you enter the Olympics or you enter the Euro Cup. That is a very small percentage. Maybe 0.1% of the football players in the world may be entering that level. Football as a profession has started at a very low level. I have got many friends who are football players who have joined the local companies in Bombay where I lived. They used to play football and they joined companies, they, they joined customs, they joined railways. So these companies, many a times, they give jobs to people who are good in that sport. For example, if you are good in football, they give you a job, you may not be good in your academics. But because they are good in football, they give you a job and they train you and they make you a professional football player. But on the low level. And here, for a few years, you play for that company. Whether it be railways, whether it be Indian customs, no problem. And at the low level, all what Sheikh Ibrahim said, it is at a very small level and surely you can avoid all these things. Paying at a lower level, Aura, if you are a Muslim, you can very well say, I will wear shorts covering the knee. Then your Aura is covered. Who is telling you to wear shorts the midway between the knee and your waist? Wear shorts which are long. Third, uh, second point, that you may miss your Salah. I know many Muslims who are five times prayers, who pray five times Salah. They never miss the Salah because of sports. They were, and the football match is for a short period. The football match normally is for one and a half hour. With the sh short break, one, one hour, 45 minutes, maximum two hours. And normally it's played in the daytime where there's no Salah. It's played in the evening. So there are less chances that you surely miss. And if you're living in a Muslim country, a Muslim majority country, they see to it that the matches are held at a time which doesn't coincide with the Salah in congregation. So you cannot give a blanket rule that is haram. Yes, you can say makru, I wouldn't mind. But saying haram, I know many people of five times they pray Salah. There are many footballers who don't pray at all. So when they don't pray normally, they don't pray even when they are playing a match. That doesn't mean that they are not praying because of the football prayer, because of the football match. So it's wrong. So many of the Muslims don't pray five times Salah. Many of the Muslims don't go to the mosque to pray. And similarly, I have got many, you know many people who are in the construction field. When they are doing a job in the construction, they aren't praying Salah. You can't say, ah, because they are not praying Salah, being a construction worker is haram. There are many Muslims who I know who are salesmen. They don't pray. So can you say that being a salesman is haram? Salesman is not haram. If he is not praying, that's his fault. In football, there are high chances that, of course, you can pray all your salah in congregation. There may be certain times where it may coincide. And at that time, you can put your foot down. And in most of the companies, if they know you are a Muslim, they will see to it, they accommodate for you. If they don't, then leave that company. And if you are living in a Muslim majority country like Malaysia, we are living, of course, the matches that take place, they see to it that it doesn't coincide with the timing of Salah. So how can you say it's haram? So I believe that 
football is perfectly fine as long as you keep all your farais and don't do anything haram. Football as a profession at a lower level, it is permissible. See, any job that you do, whether football, whether salesman, if you are so engrossed in your work and you don't offer salah, you cannot blame that job. Then Sheikh Ibrahim also says that even the spectators miss the salah. So if the spectators miss the salah, who's to blame? You as a Muslim, if you are a practicing Muslim, you will not, you will not miss your salah. Come what may come. So here you have to realize you cannot put a blanket rule that football as a profession is haram. At a lower level, it's very much possible you can be a good practicing Muslim as well as play football as a profession. When you go to higher level, maybe state level, then you go to country level, the higher level you go, the possibility of following all the faraz becomes more and more difficult. Why? At a lower level, there is no question of gambling. Who will gamble at the lower level? And majority of the people playing a professional football at the lower level. Majority at the lower level. The people who reach the international level are less than 0.1%. So you cannot give a blanket ruling that's haram. What you can say, okay, professional at international level, it may be makro, it may be haram also accepted. But not generally. So let me give you the fatwa that according to me, I believe in those scholars that generally it's not haram. And I also know the rules of football. And, and my son, mashallah, he loves football. In our school, in IF, one of the sports we encouraged was football. I don't like cricket. Cricket, you play for five days. It's a boring game. You spend the full day. I'm not saying it's haram. But it's boring. There's less exercise. Football, one and a half hour, amount you have to run, the amount of energy requires, much better than cricket. So in our school, I never encouraged cricket. I said, cricket, in my school, banned. Not Islamically, in my school. But we encourage football. And we didn't, we didn't encourage people to take football as a profession. Never. I never would want my son to become a professional football player. But he loves football. We encouraged. Alhamdulillah. And you're a very good football player. That's it. I would prefer my son going and playing football once a week, twice a week, rather than playing video games on the television. It gives. So football is good. It makes you healthy. You require stamina. Good. As a profession, I wouldn't say it's haram. I wouldn't say that Muslims should go in as a profession. But if they go at a low level, surely it's not haram. But yes, you have to be careful. That See to it that you do not miss your salah. See to it you maintain your hijab. There's no question of gambling at the lower level. At the higher level, yes, I do agree there is betting. But if you're not involved in betting, you're not responsible for that. As long as you're not involved in betting, so the higher you go, why it becomes difficult, I'll come to it. The higher level you go, to the level of the state, okay, yet possible. But when you go to the international level, when you have international clubs, then there's a lot of money involved. Like there's gambling, as Sheikh Ibrahim said, I agree with that. There's betting. But if you're not involved in betting yourself, you are not, not sinful. But what happens when you go at a higher level, I do agree, when you go to a different country and when you go to a non-Muslim country, there may be evil. At that time, when you go to a non-Muslim country for touring, do you go or not? If you can go for touring, why can't you go to play football? Okay, when you go to touring, when you see something, fire, shops, thing, you lower your gaze. So here also, when as a football player go to a non-Muslim country, if you see something obscene, you lower your gaze. We are not telling you to do the haram thing what the others are doing. I know that there are players who drink alcohol. You don't drink alcohol. Not that you have to drink, but you have to stay away from it. When you go on international level, the people that are around you, because you become a star, you get so much engrossed and so much tempted that there are high chances you may do haram things. And I agree with Sheikh Ibrahim. But that doesn't mean it's haram. You can say it is makro. And because I know most of the players, non-Muslim players, they have alcohol, they are involved in prostitution. But I know many international players, sportsmen, who are very good Muslims, who don't have alcohol at all. There are many Muslims who I know have alcohol also, they are wrong, that's wrong. I know, because there's so much 
attracted with the glamour. That they start having alcohol. So that's the reason you have to be careful. The higher you go, the more careful you have to be. Coming to the question that which Sheikh Ibrahim did not mention, a very important question. One of the factors that it will make haram is many a times on the higher level, you wear brands of companies which sponsor you. Which Sheikh Ibrahim did not mention in his fatwa. When you when mention brands which sponsor you, the brand may be haram. You cannot wear on your t-shirt an alcohol company promoting you. It's haram. I know many Muslims, player on international level, who do not wear. They said, we will not wear a t-shirt which has the logo or a brand of an alcoholic company. Very good. But at the same time, that same Muslim player is wearing a brand of a riba based bank. So for that Muslim player, he may not be having knowledge of being that riba is a bigger haram than alcohol. But in the society, alcohol is known to be haram, riba is not that known. But in the Islamic context, Allah clearly states alcohol is haram in Surah Maida chapter 5 verse 90. But Allah says in Surah Bakra chapter 2 verse number 270 and 279 that those who do not give up the demands of riba, Allah will wage a war against them. It's a multiple times much bigger sin than alcohol. If you have alcohol, Allah and his will not wage a war against you. But if you deal in riba, Allah and his will wage a war against you. Imam al dabi in his book, the Al-Qabair, the major sins, he put alcohol at number 19 and riba at number 12. So I know Muslim prayers who are very famous, who don't wear any branding of alcohol because it's haram, but they wear a brand of a conventional bank. That is lack of the knowledge or maybe the money the bank has paid is very high. So I do agree with Sheikh Ibrahim that on a higher level it's difficult to say no to these things. It's difficult. Your nafs is there. Oh, you're going to get a few million dollars. So what's the harm in wearing alcohol t-shirt? What's the harm in, in promoting a cigarette company? What's the harm in promoting a bank? And it's very difficult to abstain from this. The amount of money they give you. And we know recently what happened. Lately, we are having the Euro Cup 2020, though this is 2021, but 2020 there was the pandemic, so they could not have the cup, so they delayed it and now they are having it. And about 10 days back, <clears throat> on the 14th of June, on Monday, a very famous, or rather the most famous football player, Cristiano Ronaldo, Cristiano Ronaldo, Ronaldo. Cristiano Ronaldo is the most famous. He has more than 140 million followers on the Facebook, more than 240 million followers on Instagram. He is the most famous. Now during an interview, before the match, when he, went, when he sat on the table of the interview, there were two cans of Coca-Cola kept. He removed those two cans of Coca-Cola and put the can, put the bottle of water and said, aqua means drink water. He said Portuguese. What happened? Within, within two days, the report that came that the Coca-Cola company went in a loss of $4 billion. When I heard this news, I said, it may be exaggeration. I said, how can a company go in loss in a matter of one or two days? $4 billion? That's not the earning of Coca-Cola. I thought maybe it was exaggeration. Then I went and I googled Cristiano Ronaldo, $4 million Coca-Cola, and the article came. The article gives the details. What happened when Cristiano Ronaldo, when Cristiano Ronaldo, you know, he picked up the you know, two cans of Coca-Cola, kept it aside, the, the share price of the Coca-Cola company went down. The share price of Coca-Cola company was 56.1 uh, dollar. It fell to 55.22 dollar. And the total net worth of Coca-Cola company was 242 billion dollars. In a, just one or two days, it went down to 238 billion dollars. 
So the $4 billion went in loss because the share value of Coca-Cola from $56.1 went down to $55.22. That is, it went down by 80, 88 cents. By 88 cents it went down, multiplied by number of shares, it went in loss of $4 billion. And I confirm this. So just because this famous football player, who is the most famous in the world, picked up and kept the can, didn't see, speak a word against Coca-Cola, and just showed a bottle of water and said, drink this, $4 billion loss. This is the market you know, of ad company and the amount they spent. It is a big game. We have good people, also Muslims, in that same Euro 2020, a very famous Muslim player, Paul Pogba. What he did? When his interview came, there was a bottle of beer, alcohol. There, he removed it and kept it at the side. What happened? It was seen. He didn't speak a word. It was seen by millions of people. A few days later, the, Euro the European Cup organization says, in future, we will never keep any alcoholic drink in front of a Muslim when he's giving interview. Alhamdulillah. A new law passed. So what you have to realize that I do agree with Sheikh Ibrahim to a great extent at a high level. At low level, I don't agree to Saram. At a high level, there are high chances. And the higher you go, the more difficult it is for you to abstain from all the harams. So at the higher level, if he says it is haram, if you at the international level, I may not strongly object, but yet I would say it's makro. Because there can be a strong Muslim who will say, I will not keep any ads of haram thing on my t-shirt. I will offer my salah regularly on time. And I'll pray. And once in a while, if you, if you miss a jamaat, as long as you don't miss your prayer, there can be occasion when you appear for final examination. And you may not have time to go to the mosque and pray. Okay, you may pray a bit late, alone on your own, or in Jamaat with your friends. So once in a blue moon, if you miss, it is not a major sin, as long as you offer salah. Willingly, you cannot miss any salah. Willingly. But if you miss once in a blue moon, the congregation salah in the mosque, and you pay congregation with your friends who are your colleagues. It's not a major sin. So what you have to realize that at a higher level you have to take more precaution. If you are playing for the international football, for you to say no because you are be, being paid millions of dollars. So every time you say no, you lose millions of dollars. So the nafs will not allow you. It's a temptation. So I would say it is makhruf to take football as a profession on an international level because the high chances that will take you away from Islam but otherwise on a lower level playing for a playing as a professional football for small companies in your city or in your locality or paid for that I don't consider it to be haram yes but yet you have to be careful it can come into the makru category but if a Muslim takes care then it's permitted as long as it doesn't break any rule of the Quran and the Sharia, it's permitted. Inshallah, we'll take the last question before we end the session. Is it written in the Quran that every Muslim should pray five times a day? If yes, please tell me the ayat number and surah number. Thank you. Regarding is it mentioned in the Quran that you should pray five times a day? The word five is not mentioned in the Quran five times a day, but there are indications that you have to pray five times. Same verse in the Quran. Allah says in the Quran that you have to pray five times in Surah Hud, chapter number 11, verse number 114. In Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 78. In Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 130. As well as in Surah Rum, 
chapter number 30, verse number 17 and 18. In some verses, in one verse itself, you can come to know it five times. In some, you have to join two and you come to know it five times. Let me give you two examples from the Quran. It is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Hud, chapter number 11, verse number 114, that establish regular prayers at the two ends of the days and the approaches of night. The two ends of the day means it's two times. And the approaches of night. The Arabic word used here is Zolafun. It is not singular, it's not dual, it is a plural. In Arabic, there are three types of numbers. One is singular, the second is a dual plural, and the third is plural, which is three or more. So here the Arabic word used for approaches is not a dual plural, it is a plural, meaning three. So if you want number, it says the two ends of the night and the approaches means minimum three of night. So five times is there. The two ends of the day, the uh, Mufa Sinn of the Quran say, are the Zohar prayers and the Asar prayer. And the three approaches of night, the three night salah that you have is the Maghrib salah, the Isha salah and the Fajr salah. A similar message you get in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 130, where it says, Praise thy Lord before the rising of the sun and before the setting of the sun and in small hours of night and the two sides of the day. So before rising one, before setting two, approach of night three, two sides of the day, five. So five times is mentioned. Word five is not mentioned. Khamsa, but two plus one plus two is five. Before rising of the sun, it is the Fajr Salah. Before setting of the sun, it is the Maghrib Salah. Approaches of night, it is the Maghrib Salah. Uh, sorry, uh, before the setting of the sun, it is the Asar Salah. Before rising of the sun, it is the Fajr Salah. Before setting of the sun, it is the Asar Salah. During small hours of night, it is the Maghrib Salah. And two sides of day, it is the Isha and the Zohar Salah. So five times is mentioned. And let me tell you, brother, it's not a must that everything should be mentioned in the Quran. Even if it's mentioned in the Hadith, it's sufficient. I know there are some Muslims who say, no, we only follow Quran. This is totally wrong. Allah clearly mentioned in the Quran. Allah, what your Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. So everything is not mentioned in the Quran. If you go to the Hadith, there are several Hadith we talk that you should prefer. There's empty number of Sayyid Hadith. You read Sayyid Bukhari, poem number one, Hadith number 42, that when a man approaches a prophet, and ask him about Islam. The Prophet says that you pray five times salah in the day and night. So the man asks, should I offer anything more? The Prophet said no. If you want, you can offer nawafil salah. But the Prophet said five times salah in a day and night. Very sadhadith. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. Volume number two. Hadith number 1395. The Prophet, peace be upon him, he says to Maaz, Ma'ad bin Jabal, may Allah be pleased with him, that when he sent him to Yemen, he tells him that, tell to the people that they have to believe that la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, that there's no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. If they have obeyed them, tell them Allah has enjoined on them five times salah in a day and night. With every day and night, every 24 hours, you should offer five times salah. The very sadith. So everything of the salah is not given in the Quran. But regarding your question, is five times mentioned? I gave you the reply. But some details are mentioned in, of the salah in the Quran, about ruku, about sujood, about qayam. But minor details are not mentioned. So we as Muslims, we have to follow Allah and His Rasul. The Quran and the Sahih Hadith. So don't always be adamant that only if it is mentioned in the Quran, I will follow. If it is in the Quran, you have to follow. But there are many things which are not in the Quran, yet you have to follow. For example, Quran says, give zakat. You have to give zakat. How much to give zakat? It is mentioned in the Sahih Hadith, 2.5%. How many zakat salah you offer in the Fajr, in the Zohar, in the Maghrib, in the Asr, in the Maghrib, in the Isha? It's not there in the Quran. It is there in the Hadith. So we as Muslims should follow our deen based on the Quran, and the authentic hadith of our beloved Prophet 
And that's all we could answer for the day. Inshallah, till we meet after a fortnight, that is two weeks from now, uh, two weeks from now, on a Saturday, the same time, 11 o'clock in Malaysia, uh, 3 p.m. Makkah time, 12, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Makkah time is 6, 6 p.m. Makkah time, 3 p.m. GMT, till we meet inshallah after two weeks. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa akhir da'wana alhamdulillah wa There are two, two errors I made. So please replace it with the right word. The Arabic word is Zulafan. Zulafun, sorry? Zulafan. Zulafan. The Arabic word is Zulafan. When I use for the plural, for approaches. So please replace it in the place in the lecture. Zulafan. 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 And in the name of the football player, the right name is Cristiano Ronaldo. Cristiano Ronaldo. Cristiano Ronaldo. Use the last word. Cristiano Ronaldo. Jazakallah. Thank you.